Okay, now we're going <clears> to <throat> kind of put it all together and talk about heart-lung interactions. Sp ventilation is exercise, spontaneous breathing, that made us. Spontaneous ventilation increases the amount of preload, intrathoracic blood volume, and also increases left ventricular afterload, and positive pressure of breathing does the exact opposite. If you know those things, you know the entire lecture. I'm just going to show you the clinical relevance of these. The biggest problem occurs with initiation of mechanical ventilation and with extubation. Breathing is exercise. A number of studies that have shown that breathing is exercise increases oxygen consumption using skeletal muscle exercise of the diaphragm and makes CO2 is too numerous to talk. I like the study by Zev Masinifar that said if you have heart failure and I have you breathe spontaneously, your gut will become ischemic. And then Amal Gibran so that the arterial venous CO2 gradient fell. <clears throat> what Zev Masinifar did is he said, if the gut, if I exercise a person with heart failure, their gut becomes ischemic. So why don't we wean them? So he took COPD patients and weaned them. And those that were successfully able to wean did not develop gut ischemia, here measured by gut pH. Whereas the patients who were subsequently going to fail not only had a lower value to begin with, but it fell to levels equal to severe shock. Amal Gibran then said, if this is the case, I should see the mixed venous oxygen saturation falling because the cardiac output will be inadequate to meet the needs. And that's exactly what she saw in patients who are weaning failures. Potentially the reason why all mechanical ventilation parameters used to predict who will wean or not from a ventilator are so terrible is that none of them take cardiovascular reserve into their determination. This is truly the big fish. If it is exercise, then it can be used as a cardiac stress test. And again, the number of studies that have shown that spontaneous breathing or extubation induces uh, cardiovascular stress are too numerous to count. My favorite one is by um, Francois Lemaire. This is a copy of the original slide of his original presentation. And this is an example of one patient. You can see the esophageal pressure here is around four. The pulmonary occlusion pressure looks like it's around 18, 16, something like that. And then he places the patient on spontaneous breathing. The esophageal pressure at end expiration becomes more negative as the patient holds their lungs open. And there are massive negative swings in pleural pressure down to minus 20 or 30. The pulmonary artery occlusion pressure rises to 40. And by nine minutes, it's up to I'm not sure why that does that. In nine minutes, it's up to 50, and there's agonal respiration. And I asked Francois, what happened right here? And he said, oh, I put the patient on the ventilator or they'd have died. Said in another way, it is not subtle. <clears throat> it's liberation from ventilation. So now, let's, now that you accept that spontaneous breathing is exercise, now let's look at the causes of the mechanical interactions that have to do with changes in ventilation on the circulation and vice versa. But this is going to be the effects of ventilation, uh, hemodynamic effects of ventilation. All forms of breathing change lung volume. They go up from uh, functional residual capacity and they change intrathoracic pressure. Both spontaneous and positive pressure breathing increase lung volume. But pleural pressure falls with spontaneous breathing and rises with positive pressure breathing. Thus, the hemodynamic effects that are different between spontaneous and positive pressure breathing are due to the changes in intrathoracic pressure and the energy necessary to create those changes. Under normal conditions, if we look at the lungs alone, if you have a spontaneous inspiration, you get vagal withdrawal and you get cardiac acceleration. And that's a nice way of showing that you've got normal autonomic tone. Also, as the lungs get bigger, they alter their vascular resistance. If you have hypoxia in the lungs, you get hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, and that increases pulmonary vascular resistance. As the lung volumes get bigger, they are compressed, and autonomic tone is changed. So let's look first at the lung volume relative to where it is. The pulmonary vasculature can be thought of as being two types of vessels, the alveolar vessels 
and the extra alveolar vessels. The alveolar vessels sense those little capillaries, their outside pressure is alveolar pressure and all the other vessels in the lungs sense interstitial or pleural pressure as their outside pressure. And the difference between alveolar and pleural pressure is the transpulmonary pressure. It's the distending pressure of the lung. Thus, as your lungs get bigger, the transpulmonary pressure gets bigger. Okay. And so when we look at pulmonary vascular resistance versus lung volume, we see that at FRC, our resistance is the lowest it'll be and that at low lung volumes and high lung volume resistance rises. But the reason it rises is different depending on low or high lung volumes. Alveolar resistance is close to zero. They're just capillaries. But as the transpulmonary pressure gets bigger and bigger, as the lungs get bigger and bigger, if the transpulmonary pressure exceeds pulmonary artery pressure, the vessels are compressed and collapse, increasing pulmonary vascular resistance. The extra alveolar vessels at large lung volumes are held open just like the airways are held open at large lung volumes. But as the lung collapses, as it gets smaller by the process of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, pulmonary vascular resistance increases. So decreases in lung volume below FRC it cause hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. All forms of acute respiratory failure are associated with low lung volumes. Increases in lung volume above FRC collapse the alveolar vessels. All forms of COPD, respiratory failure, are associated with increases in lung volume. Hyperinflation and COPD is profoundly common. And as Marini and Pepe showed in their nice paper, if you just take a patient and remove them from the ventilator, you, when they're hyperinflated, their esophageal pressure will fall, as you can see, and the cardiac output rises from 2.6 to 4.7 because of the fact that the hyperinflation increases vascular resistance. Well, if this is true, then PEEP should recruit lung units, but if I have too much, it should hurt them. So Canada et al. looked at pulmonary vascular resistance of lungs in which they caused one lung to be injured and the other not in a dog. And they progressively increased giving PEEP in a baseline. The uh, sick lung had a very high vascular resistance, which fell when the PEEP was added, 5, 10, and 15, this is almost assuredly hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction being reversed. The normal lung had no problems, and as you added more lung volume, its resistance rose. But look, there's nothing special about acute lung injury. Once both lungs have been opened, more PEEP increases pulmonary vascular resistance on all lungs. Finally, as the lung volume gets bigger, the chest wall can expand, the diaphragm can descend, but the heart is trapped in the cardiac fossa and gets smaller. That was nicely shown in this study in which a CT scan was done on the same patient on ZEEP and on PEEP of 10. Look at how much the left ventricle volumes get smaller. That's just from increasing intrathoracic pressure. So now let's look at the effects of intrathoracic pressure on left ventricular function. Remember, increases and decreases in intrathoracic pressure will affect the pressure gradient for venous return and left ventricular ejection from the heart, independent of the heart itself. And you've seen this normal ventricular function curve, and Shelley showed you the venous return curve in his lecture. You and I have an equilibrium point. So you can see that with spontaneous breathing, as pleural pressure falls, CVP goes down, filling the ventricle more, and right ventricular stroke volume goes up. The opposite occurs with positive pressure breathing. So the CVP goes down, but the stroke volume goes up. I don't know what just happened here. This machine is funny. Okay. All I did was plus return. So. We said that the CVP went down and the stroke volume went up. CVP went down, the stroke volume went up. That's called spontaneous breathing. And this is without a change in function, and this is the reason why, sorry, this is the reason why spontaneous breathing has a higher cardiac output than apnea. And this was shown by me a few years ago in which we measured the spontaneous breaths and you can see that the right ventricular stroke volume went up a bit, but if you occluded the airway and had a really deep inspiration, you had a massive increase in right ventricular stroke volume. Loaded spontaneous inspiration causes, uh, occurs with cardiac insufficiency, 
It causes pulmonary edema. If you want to increase cardiac output and CPR after the chest compression is over, keep the airway occluded for half a second to allow the recoil to keep the pressure in the chest negative and release it, and you'll double cardiac output. Negative expiratory pressure also improves cardiac output in patients, I mean, pigs with shock. What about positive pressure breathing? Well, the heart's in the chest, and so when I increase intrathoracic pressure, remember CVP went up and cardiac output went down. What we normally do is give them fluids. CVP goes up further, but our cardiac output's normal. This is why you fluid restrict a patient before extubation because they're all going to have any, this increase in volume come back, as Francois Lemaire showed in his study. And in fact, Antoine Villarbron showed that what I showed in pigs was also, I mean, in dogs was also true in humans. And furthermore, with Jamie Mosqueda, we showed that the greater the tidal volume that you had, the greater the amount of blood that leaves the chest, whether it be 5, 10, 15, or 25 ml tidal volumes. So now let's look at the other way. Increases in intrathoracic pressure, decreasing left ventricular afterload. And this is a really hard thing to explain, so I prefer to show you a picture of my children instead. This is Stephanie, Daniel, and Jill. They're swimming. Do you care how tall my kids are? Or how high their heads are above the water? It is the height of their heads above the water, which is their transmural pressure. That might be their heights, but that's their transmural pressure. And thus, if I have an arterial pressure of 150 and I give phenylephrine infusion to make it 200, I've increased afterload to 200. But I can keep the arterial pressure at 150 and have an occluded airway and breathe into minus 50, and I have to go from minus 50 to zero to 150, and that's the same increase in afterload. Negative swings in intrathoracic pressure increase afterload, and as we showed in 1979, when you do that, the right ventricle in a healthy person massively dilates up. This is the reason why negative swings in intrathoracic pressure causes pulmonary edema. This is why laryngeal spasm, um, uh, airway obstruction kills you. You have the increase in venous return and the impediment to right left ventricular ejection. Well, if that's true, if I make the pressure positive, although I'm going to decrease venous return, I might do the same as nitroprusside, decrease afterload. And so we showed that in an animal model, if you increase and with heart, severe heart failure, if you increase intrathoracic pressure, intravascular volumes decrease because that's what they should do. It always goes down. But cardiac output actually goes up because you're decreasing afterload and heart failure. And we show that in heart failure in humans. We could do it in a cardiac cycle specific way and could reverse mitral regurgitation. And this is the reason why PEEP has minimal effects, but if you're in heart failure, it will actually increase cardiac output. Well, I can't give you positive pressure because it's too hard, but I can take away negative pressure. A person with airway obstruction or bronchospasm, if you intubate them or give them CPAP, the, abolishing the negative swings in intrathoracic pressure will equal adding positive pressure without any hurt on venous return. And the number of studies that have shown that using CPAP or BiPAP decreases cardiac stress are too numerous to count based exactly on that physiology. This is the reason why your first treatment for acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema is CPAP. And that was nicely shown by Radisson, who looked at it in patients who had acute myocardial infarction. He only got a benefit of the CPAP when the swings in negative intrathoracic pressure were abolished. And if you do that, you improve survival in acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema, both in a couple of hours and a couple of days. Look at the difference in mortality. And it doesn't matter if it's BiPAP or CPAP. It's not the inspiratory pressure that's helping you. It's the eliminating the negative swings in intrathoracic pressure. Thus, to summarize, as the work of breathing increases or cardiovascular reserve decreases, Spontaneous ventilation may impose excessive metabolic demand on the heart and circulation, inducing shock and making the patient unable to be weaned. 
Said in another way, never try to wean a hemodynamically unstable patient. Failure to wean from mechanical ventilation often reflects impaired cardiovascular reserve. And abolishing negative swings in intrathoracic pressure markedly decreases negative afterload on the heart and helps it by decreasing ischemia. Thank you for your attention.